it's best is to let go and have a happy time. When the bus is going over the cliff, it's going over the cliff anyway, so why not smile and have a happy time as you go over? That's my motto. So whatever happens, you can always uh, be fearless. And you will actually find that when you're not afraid, then things don't go wrong. It's only when you are afraid that the bus goes over the cliff. When you're not afraid, it keeps on the road. One of my first experiences with that is when I was a kid in London and I got my first bicycle. And if you remember when you tried to sort of ride a bicycle, you kept on falling off. And the reason I was falling off is because I was so afraid to fall off. I was holding those handlebars until my knuckles went white. I was so stiff, which meant that you know, I couldn't sort of adjust the body to move it, to, to actually stay um, vertical. I kept on falling off, and the more I fell off, the more afraid I was, and that made me more rigid, which made me fall off more often. Until I realized, well, I saw all these other kids riding their bicycle, and they were just you know, one-handed, sometimes no-handed, sometimes no teeth. But that was because they were a bit too no handed. But eventually you really learn that you can just relax. And when you relax, you didn't fall off. Because then your body was really loose. You could go this way and that way, and you didn't actually uh, fall off your bike. And that became one of the first times I realized it's fear is the problem. Because fear means you can over control, because you're over control which means you cannot just adjust to life as it happens, which means you're far too rigid, and that's where all the sufferings and pain of life comes from. Now, the rigidity of life. Because like, life doesn't go according to plan anyway. You know, my aircraft left late. Now, sometimes I've been on these aircraft going overseas to give talks. I remember going on Garuda once, and I had to give a talk in Indonesia. It was a big talk, it was planned, it was in a hotel and the flight was delayed. It was actually cancelled. And I really thought, why on earth is cancelled? Actually, I knew why. There was a good reason why it was cancelled, because that's the time they had bird flu in Indonesia, and Garuda was a bird. So I thought, well, they've got bird flu. <laughs> it just, it just, it just, there was also that time, actually this was happened when they flight from Perth to Singapore, where the Qantas flight I think over at Exmouth, I think it was, it suddenly sort of dropped very quickly, went up again and dropped again. And people actually, some people got injured. I said, what do you expect? It's a flying kangaroo. That's what kangaroos do. They go up, they go down, they go up, they go down. So that's what happens. But anyway, even when it did go wrong, it wasn't the end of the world. No, the arranger could talk the next day. So what? It was actually a very good talk because people there realised that life is uncertain. I think that's a the title of my talk anyway, that life is uncertain, and instead of actually telling them about it, they, they experienced it, because I never turned up. <laughs> so life never goes according to plan. Now look at me. I never ever thought that I'd end up in this you know, Rosalie Community Centre giving a talk as a monk. And I started off in a totally different direction. I was a, a theoretical physicist. I was supposed to be, you know, uh, finding out the secrets. Actually, I am finding out the secrets of the universe, but not with big atom smashers in laboratories. You know, one of the things which I remember from those days, and it's one of the reasons why I gave up science, because science, like many religions, were far too dogmatic. And this was, I remember, this was the days when graffiti was actually encouraged because a lot of graffiti were very, very wise words. And this was written on the Cavendish Laboratory at Cambridge University. Chalk, sorry, pencil on the grey stone was written the words, the eminence of a great scientist is measured by the length of time they stop progress in their field. The eminence of a great scientist is measured by the length of time they stop progress in their field. Do you understand why? Because these are the professors, these are the experts, they know everything. And when these other young researchers come along and prove they're wrong, no, no, it's the new researchers are wrong because the professors, the experts, can't be wrong. And that is one of the problems with science. I remember just 
one of the fellows here in Sydney many years ago, he was a GP, he just graduated, and I think he went to Orchid Southwood Hospital, and he said, I don't know, maybe some of you may have been at this uh, particular talk, it was the introductory talk to med school for all these sort of the new intake of medical students that year, and the professor was about to retire, and he opened his address, welcoming the new medical students, saying, 50% of what we're going to tell you or teach you in the next four years is wrong. Our trouble is we don't know which 50% it is. <laughs> now that was a scientist. And he wasn't afraid of saying that. Because when we put science, when we put uh, the future, even when we put Buddhism and religion in concrete and say this is it, it cannot be changed. We get dogma. Our future religion dogma is set in contract in concrete, and it means we can't adapt, we can't change, we can't move. And you know, a lot of that is where we get control from. The fear to adapt and change and just open up to the to the uncertainty of life and just see what would happen. It is because people fear the future that many of them actually come to places like this. Because you fear the future, because maybe you can learn some wise strategies, learn meditation so you don't get cancers, learn how to uh, settle your relationships so you can always keep your partner, learn sort of magic charts so you can live to 100 years of age. Actually, I've got to be very careful with you know, some of these Buddhist chanting. It is, it's really weird sometimes. I've been doing this a long time. And there was an article in the local paper in Perth last week. And when I saw that article, I was very upset. Because it was an article, well, I better, maybe I better go back a little bit. About three or four years ago, one of my friends in Perth said one of his associates was, was opening a new shop. And he said, you're a Buddhist monk, would you mind coming to bless my friend's shop for me? And my trouble is, you know, I, I always say yes, and I don't really actually ask what I'm supposed to be doing. And so I turned up at this shop, you know, with all the paraphernalia, you know, the, the period thread, you know, your Sri Lankans and the swish and doing all the chanting. And I found out his shop was in a shopping centre, it was a lottery store, which sold lottery tickets. <laughs> and I'm a Buddhist monk, we're not supposed to get involved in that sort of stuff. <laughs> but it was too late, I'd already agreed. And that's the only, that is the only lottery outlet in the whole of Australia I've ever blessed. <laughs> and in the newspapers last week, it was featured, I recognised it, the most successful lottery outlet in the whole of Australia. More winning tickets have been sold there than anywhere else. <laughs> and you've got to be very careful. I mean, that's why, you know, that's the sort of thing I should be very careful of, you know, any sort of gathering. And this is actually another story. I mean, there are a few people here, uh, Buddhists who have been Buddhists a long time ago. There was a very famous nun many years ago. She passed away. Uh, she was uh, German, but she came to Sydney. She started a monastery very close by to here. And her name was Ayakema. I think many of you remember her. And this was a story about her. She was teaching a meditation retreat in England. And when the meditation retreat was finished, uh, her driver, who was also a friend, uh, that's Anya, Anya Tacton, I don't know if she's here this evening, but many of you know Anya. Uh, she was driving Arya Ken, this uh, Australian Buddhist nun, to Heathrow Airport. And on the way, they had to stop for lunch. Now, those of you who've been to UK, now, now many of the restaurants in the countryside are next to the pub. But you're not actually in the pub. You just have to go to the front of the pub, and then you go sort of into the restaurant. So they went into the restaurant, and then uh, Aya Ken was still finishing eating, and so Anya paid the bill, and she had a few British coins left. And at the entrance of the pub, they had a pokey machine. And she was just putting the coins in the slot and putting the handle, you know, just trying to get rid of the coins, you know, instead of taking them all the way back to Australia. And she just put in a two-pound coin in the slot when the Buddhist nun walked by. 
<laughs> and she said, Ayakema, you're a Buddhist nun, you've got all the good karma, you pull the handle. <laughs> and losing her mindfulness for a second, that's all it takes to get into trouble. She pulled the handle. Now this is no exaggeration, this happened. Jackpot. <laughs> These thousands of pounds came out of the machine. And everybody in the pub were quiet. They went silent. And then the bartender, the guy behind the counter, rang the bell. Ding, 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 ding. Because the custom, the rule was, that if you won the jackpot, you had to buy a round of drinks for everybody in the pub. <laughs> and so this Buddhist nun, who's not even allowed to drink, had to shout everybody in that pub, whiskey, beer, rum, whatever they wanted, she had to buy it for them. That's why we have to be very careful not to mess around with these things. But because of that, people think that these months we've got power. So it means that when sometimes you get so afraid, you ask the monks, or the nuns, like the monks behind me, Venerable, can you do some chanting for me? Can you sort of make sure I have a good future? Again, you're just using the monks as a, to control your future. Sometimes people, you know that lottery store which has won so much money? They give me nothing, no commission. <laughs> Really but no, because so many people want to predict the future, sometimes they go to these monks. I was in Hong Kong last month, and there's this whole street in Kowloon with all these fortune tellers, and people are lining up to get their fortune told. Why? Because we're so afraid of what might happen next. And that's the one of the reasons why monks are not allowed to do that. They can't tell, well they can tell futures, but they don't do that. It's against our rules. But one day, one day, this man came to see my teacher. And he said, Ajahn Chah, I know you can tell my future. Read the lines on my hand, on my palm. And Ajahn Chah said, no, monks of our tradition, we can't do that. It's against our rule. But this man was very clever. He was prepared for that answer. And he said, Ajahn Chah, don't you remember the last week in your sermon, you taught us about gratitude. I've been feeding you for so many years. I've been giving donations into the box. I've been even taking you around from place to place. You talk about gratitude. This is the first time I've asked you anything. Come on, show some gratitude. That was a very clever argument. So Ajahn Chah had no choice. He said, give me your hand. And so this was the first, the one and only time the great master in Thailand read the line of the disciple's hand. And Ajahn Chah was a great monk. He wouldn't lie. And if whatever he said would happen, we all knew that must come true because he was such a powerful meditating monk. But Ajahn Chah took such a long time draw, uh, taking his hand, his uh, finger, and just tracing the lines of this man's palm with full concentration. And every now and again, Ajahn Chah would stop and say something like, ooh, that's interesting. Mm, I don't know about that. Oh, that's okay. And he was winding this guy up until the guy I was so excited. He couldn't wait for Ajahn Chah to finish. And eventually Ajahn Chah did finish. And the guy said, yes, 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 what's my future going to be? And very slowly, the master said, whatever I tell you is going to be true. Yes, I know, but tell me. 
your future. Yes, yes, yes. Your future is uncertain. <laughs> and Ajahn Chah wasn't wrong. Why would that? That's actually, I can tell your future too. All of your people's future here is uncertain. You have an election here, aren't you, soon? You know who's going to win? Uncertain. <laughs> no one ever knows the future. But the thing is, because of fear, we try and want to know the future. We have to predict it. Why can't we just let the future evolve and just enjoy his evolution rather than being so afraid we try to control and make it happen because it's that fear which produces all the problems the way where people are really afraid sometimes that people especially in Sydney there's a big crime right here in Sydney even my bag I, I've got a little bag, it's, my, my, it's got my passport in it and ticket and uh, instead of leaving in the room over there I said should I leave it in the room over there and they said that's no, okay we've got two security and I looked at the two security people and I decided to bring it up here <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble for that but people are so paranoid these days that over in Perth you know this is where I come from, you know this we have a big mining boom in West Australia. And so many people that have this fly-in, fly-out policy. They've spent like one or two weeks working up north and they fly back to Perth. But then they you know, stay maybe one or two more weeks and they fly back up again. In the height of the boom, people fly you know, even from Sydney and Melbourne as well. But anyway, it was this guy over in Perth. And he was a bit afraid that when he was up north in the mines, his young wife was alone in the house and she was afraid what would happen if a burglar came in. So he decided to get a watchdog to protect his wife from burglars. So he went to the pet shop. He said, I'll need a big dog, you know, like a, uh, a big dog, uh, Doberman or sort of something like that, to protect my wife you know, from burglars. And the pet shop owner said, I've just got the dog for you. So he went round the back and brought out this nine inch Pekingese. <laughs> A dog like that can't protect any burglars. What have you got that dog for? He said, this dog, sir, was from China. It was brought up in a Buddhist monastery just outside of Beijing, and it was taught karate by the monks. <laughs> it's a karate dog. <laughs> Will you laugh? Listen, said the owner. You know, I'll show you, I'll prove what this dog can do. And he pointed to this old sort of cardboard box. And he told the dog, karate my box. And that dog went over to that box, and within 60 seconds, that box was shredded. That was just slivers of cardboard. And the owner said to the dog, the chair, karate my chair. In a couple of minutes, that was matchsticks. It was shredded. That was one mean and vicious dog. It's a karate dog. So he said, here, I'll take that. That'll protect my wife. So he took it home. And of course, as soon as his wife saw that, so said, what's that? He said, that's a new watchdog. And she started laughing, man, you did. And he said, well, that won't protect me from anything. It's a karate dog. And she said, karate my ass. <laughs> and I won't tell you what happened next. <laughs> So every now and again in my talks, I tell the jokes because that means this was actually taught to me by a Tibetan monk a long time ago. Because when people have got their mouths open, that's when you can actually put the pill of Dharma in. You're actually listening then. <laughs> so, why are we just so afraid? Well, this is a, a nice story about how to react to things like burdens. I don't know if I told this last time, but. I know that somebody asked me, I just came back from Sri Lanka, there's many Sri Lankans here, and they were wondered how my trip to Sri Lanka went. And I told this story to your president, and also uh, told it on TV, live TV around the country. It's a very beautiful story. 
about what spirituality really is and how we can overcome fear and actually how we can have a really peaceful, wonderful life. It's the story of the monk, the abbot, who was woken up early in the morning. Did I tell this last year? What I was here? Okay, good. <laughs> the other monks are getting quite old. I always like teaching elderly audiences because they can't remember the joke which I told last time. <laughs> But anyway, there was a, a, a monk, and he's the abbot of the temple. He, he woke up early in the morning, about three o'clock. Someone was in the main meditation room. And he wondered, you know, who that was? Was that one of the monks getting up early? And he looked around at his monks and said, no, none of them would get up that early. So he had got up himself to investigate. And when he went into the room, he found it was a burglar. There was a burglar trying to open the donation box with a knife. And as soon as the burglar saw the monk, he pointed the knife at the monk. Keep away! And the monk said, what are you doing? None of your business! And soon the monk realized what was going on. He was trying to open the donation box. So the monk put his hand in the pocket. What are you doing? And the monk brought out a bunch of keys. Here, said the monk, open it with the key then you won't ruin the box. And the thief said, is this some kind of trick? No, said the monk, this is charity, this is donations, this is trying to help people. So you're very poor, you must need this money. So help yourself. This is what charity is for, for sharing. Now how many big temples have we got in this world? And isn't it nice to help poor people? So he told this, this robber, help yourself. So the robber took the key, and with one eye he opened the box, the other eye he looked at this monk, and he pointed the knife at the monk just in case. And as he was emptying out all the money from the donation box, the abbot said, when was the last time you had something to eat? What do you mean? Above the the donation box in the cupboard, you will find some food left over from today's meal. Help yourself, take whatever you want. And so the thief also took some old sandwiches and cakes and shut them in his pockets on top of the money. And don't tell the police, said the burglar as he went out the door. Why should I, said the monk, I've given you the money and I've given you the food. Go in peace with my blessing. <laughs> <laughs> and the burglar ran away. And the following morning, the monk explained to his committee what had happened. You know, they were very proud of him. Because isn't it nice if it's a priest or, or monks that actually we share with each other? Do you remember that? Term? I never actually um, saw Les Miserables, but remember the book? You know, when actually the priest gave a silver candlestick to the man so he could have something to eat and start a business. Well, that to me is spirituality. That's what religion should be like. But please don't come to my temple to open the donation box every week. <laughs> but anyway, that's what this guy did. And the committee were very happy with him. And actually, a few days later, he was reading the newspaper and he saw that same burglar had been caught by the police while in another house. And he was put in jail for 10 years. Just after 10 years, that monk, much older, was woken up in the middle of the night. He went into the shrine room, the meditation room, and who did he think he saw? The old burglar again. The old burglar had a knife who was next to the donation box. Do you remember me? said the burglar. Yes, said the monk, here's the key. <laughs> to which the burglar smiled and said, I don't want the key to the donation box. He said, for the last 10 years, in my prison cell, I couldn't get you out of my mind every day. In all my life, you're the only person who's been kind to me. 
who hasn't shown fear, but has shown compassion. So kind, you've been generous to me. I can never forget you. All those years in prison, I realized one thing. The last time I came to this temple, I stole the wrong thing. What I really want to steal this time is the secret of your kindness. Please make me a monk. Because <laughs> isn't that what we want? The secret of kindness, generosity, peace, and even fearlessness. So don't be afraid to be kind to people. Don't be afraid to give people the benefit of the doubt. Don't be afraid to be compassionate to others and compassionate to yourself. And we are afraid. Because sometimes we think, if I'm kind to my husband, my good is bad enough already, he'll get much worse. If I'm kind to my wife, if I'm compassionate to my children, what will they do? They need a firm hand, they need controlling. Do they? I know, having uh, been in Australia for 28 years now, and I've now seen all these kids grow up, and I've had to intervene for them with their parents, to say, no, please, trust them. Trust them, let them take chances, let them go out, let them choose their own partner, let them choose their job or the career they want. Don't be afraid because your lack of your fear is actually stopping them exploring their life and going where they will. And when I've given that advice, and the parents have let their children just follow, follow their nose, follow their passions, follow wherever they go in life, the kids have always turned out amazingly wonderful children. There's one kid I remember that Ah, he wasn't good at school. His mother never told him to keep on going, um, keep on um, working out his studies. So he left school when he was about 14 or 15 or 16 or something. I don't think he ever finished the high school. But he took a nice, because he was a really good kid. He did an apprenticeship as a cook, I think it down in Margaret River in the south of Western Australia. And last year in November, there's a TV program called Iron Chef. I don't even know Iron Chef. And apparently he's the first sort of non-professional to be the professional chef. He did it, he won that program. And why did he do that? I know why he did that. Because his parents gave him confidence. They say, go off and try it, do whatever you feel you want to do. And that confidence, that lack of fear, that has made him to be a very, very successful person. So when you're like afraid, isn't that, say you're in, you know, all of you relationships are a big part of life, if you're really afraid of what your partner might do when you're out, when you're somewhere else, you're always sort of watching over them, is that any type of relationship you like being in? If you're afraid your relationship is not going to last, and it doesn't last, if you're afraid that your partner's going to misbehave, then they do behave. Why? Because you're not trusting them. Isn't trust the most important part of any relationship? If people do let you down, as I said here last time, I do remember I gave a talk on forgiveness. People asked me that question before. In Buddhism, how many times should you forgive? And the answer is always one more time. <laughs> Forgiveness is beautiful. You want to be forgiven. I want to be forgiven. So always forgive one more time. Which means you don't have to fear. Which means you don't have to control. And when you don't fear, when you don't control, that's called love. Love and trust. One thing which my father told me, which you know, many have heard this story before, but it's a powerful one. It just comes up in this talk. About 13 years of age, in one of the back streets of Acton in West London, it was a very poor part of London, 
my father took me aside in his beaten up old car and said to me, son, whatever you do in your life, wherever you go, however you turn out, I want you to remember one thing. And that thing is the door of my house will always be open to you. No matter where you go, no matter what you do or how you turn out. I'm your dad, my home is your home. I remember I was only 13. To me, it was important, but I didn't really understand it until many years later. When I became a monk and had time to contemplate, I realized that he wasn't opening the door of his house, because his house was a government-assisted uh, apartment. He was very, very poor. What he really meant was son, the door of my heart is open to you. And the most important thing was no matter what you ever do in your life, it was unconditional love, which is the opposite of fear-based control. He said you could do anything, wherever you go, however you turn out. I'm your father, I'll always love you, always know that the door of my heart is always open. That's trust. That takes fearlessness. He would give me a blank check. And of course, you know when you have advice like that, how you turn out. If you can say that to your partner and mean it, then you're no longer a control freak. And you've overcome your fear. And you've started to understand what love truly means. If you can say that to your kids, well, let's take that further. If you can say that to life. Life, the door of my heart is open to you. No matter what you ever do. No matter how life turns out. Cancer. If Sri Lanka loses the next World Cup cricket match. It was a great relief when I found out that Sri Lanka versus Australia was a draw. <laughs> Otherwise, there would be much disharmony in this. <laughs> but isn't that wonderful? When you open the door of your life to whatever happens, it means, what are you afraid of? You can accept everything which happens in life. And you know when you don't have a fear-based life, you know you can open the door, you can love whatever happens in life. Most of the things which go wrong in your life, which are all stress-based, based on fear, don't go wrong. I remember reading uh, something in English literature uh, when I was uh, a student at university. It was some of the short stories of Edgar Allan Poe. Edgar Allan Poe was a really weird story writer. He had all these, these uh, very uh, graphic and sometimes quite sick imagination. And one of the uh, short stories was the, the Mask of the Red Death. It was a little short story about the time in Europe when they had all these plagues, which really decimated many parts of Europe. I think something like 30 or 40 percent of the population of Europe died. I mean, that was a real big epidemic. And in this particular scene from his book, he said these like demons who always were carrying this, this plague of, of, of the, the, the bubonic plague or the, whatever it was. Because this is how they visualized or explained these, you know, this plague. It was like demons were coming into the cities. And he said that these demons met in a forest somewhere in Europe and they conferred on what they had done. And one of these little devils said, I was in Paris, I killed 10,000, which was a lot of people in those days. And someone said, in London, I killed 15,000. And in Berlin, now I killed sort of 20,000. And uh, one of the other demons said, now in Madrid, now I killed only 5,000, but fear killed 50,000. And I remember reading that and I thought, that guy understands that the burst plague is fear. That kills more people than any plague. The fear 
kills people much more than fear creates the cancers, fear creates the diseases, fear creates the separations in your relationships. Fear is the problem. You should all know that by now. And I know that because I know the way the mind works, I know how meditation works. From fear, you get stress. And stress makes you overreact and try and control the future, worrying about the future. And of course, you know if you control and worry about the future, you tense up. Just like I was saying that the bicycle I kept on falling off when I was trying to control that bike, when I was trying to be, uh, make sure I, wasn't, I was too afraid of falling off, that was the problem. That is most of the problems with cancers and other diseases in this world. We're so afraid of getting them, we tense out, we stress out, we do get them. We're so afraid of getting the sack, we're so afraid of you know, losing all our money. You don't need to be afraid of anything in this world. Look, if you lose your partner and you lose your money and you lose your house, brilliant, you can become a monk like me. <laughs> There's always something you could do. You don't have to be afraid. Because it's fear is a big problem. And for those of you who are serious Buddhists and have done a lot of meditation, the only reason why you've never got really still and peaceful in your meditation is because you're just run by fear. You're afraid if you don't concentrate you'll fall asleep. Or your mind will wander all over the place. Or if you don't focus on some object of meditation, you will never get enlightened. The fear is the problem. Because when you fear, you control. When you control, you get tense. That's not the way to have a peaceful, free mind. Instead, what do we do? We let go. So if you fall asleep, fine. You deserve it. If you're meditating at home and you start snoring, well done. Congratulations. <laughs> you know, once I read this in the commentaries of Buddhism, the Buddha himself was walking with his attendant who was called Amanda. And they saw a monk in the forest. And this monk was sitting with a straight back, his right hand over his left hand, perfect posture, full lotus, the works. Absolutely motionless. And the Buddha turned around to Ananda and said, I'm worried about that monk. <laughs> Two weeks later he disrobed, a few weeks later got married. <laughs> and in the same story, he saw another monk in the forest. And he was nodding this way and nodding that way and nodding. And the Buddha turned around to his attendant and he smiled. I'm not worried about him. <laughs> and two weeks later he became perfectly in line with all the psychic powers. When I first read that, you know, I couldn't understand it. I thought, no, aren't we supposed to have perfect posture? Aren't we supposed to make enlightenment happen? And after many years as a monk, I realised what the answer was. Of course, the Buddha was right. Because that first monk was a control freak. Just making his body absolutely straight. And I was with a monk like that for four years, in my early years in Thailand, he would never nod or fall asleep, even when we used to meditate all night. And then suddenly he just disrobed. We all thought he was close to enlightenment because he was such a great meditator on the outside. But afterwards we talked to him and said, we thought you were in this deep meditation, you never moved. And he said, no. I was just so controlling, so afraid of falling asleep, so afraid of doing something wrong. For four years I was in such pain and agony, so tense. He said, sometimes, he said, I'd open my eyes and look at you, Ajahn Brahm. And you were nodding this way and nodding that way. I was so jealous. I wish I could do that. I wish I could let go enough to fall asleep. He was control freak. And that's why after four years of torture, he could stand it no longer. Do you understand what I'm talking about now? Now this is what we learn in meditation. And the meditation transfers into your life. If you try to meditate, you just can't do it. I'll, I'll give you a nice deep teaching now. 
This was one of those teachings by Ajahn Chah which is in no book. When I wrote my book on meditation, I forgot all about it. Because I learned this in the first year, and it was one of those teachings of a great meditation master which was absolutely crazy. It was so uh, out of left field, off the planet, that I didn't give it a second thought until much, much later. Because this master, he said his monastery, his monastery was a mango grove, he said. And the mango grove, he said, was planted by the Buddha. So this meant to me it was a simile. And he said, the mangoes on this mango grove, there's so many, hundreds and thousands of them, they're so ripe and juicy. And he said, you monks these days don't need to climb the tree to get the mango. You don't need to throw a stick up to get the mango down. You don't even need to shake the tree. All you need to do is to put your hand down and a mango will fall into it. That's all. That's crazy! I've seen mango trees. If I hold a hand out, it will take days before a mango falls. And if it does, it falls over there, never into my hand. What do you mean, you crazy monk? And of course, this was a metaphor for happiness, for freedom, for even enlightenment, certainly for the deep meditation. If you climb the meditation tree to try and make it happen, if you shake it or throw sticks up of life trying to get what you want, you never get it. It never falls. But if you open up your hand, open up your mind, your life, opening the door of your heart to this moment, then the man goes fall right into your hand. If you try to meditate, you will never succeed. I tell people, and I'm being a very honest monk, Ajahn Brahm, I'm a famous teacher of meditation, go all over the world. I can't meditate. I put my hand up, I am a hopeless meditator. I can't do it. Because every time I try, I can't do it. But when I stop trying, when I get out of the way, when I stop shaking the mango tree, then meditation happens. That's why I say, I can't meditate. I disappear. And then meditation happens. Deep meditation, powerful meditation. That's why it takes a lot of abandoning of fear. The fear that it will all go wrong if you don't keep on top of things. The fear that you will fail if you don't keep trying so hard. The fear that people will criticize you and blame you. When you let go of that fear, then things don't go wrong. They go beautifully right. You know that when I give a talk, as I said, I don't know what I'm going to talk about. But when I give talks, I have no fear. That's why they usually come out pretty well. Do you understand what I'm meaning? As I meditate, so I talk, so I live my life. You go to the monastery where I live, there's lots of monks there. I don't control them. I trust them. I love them. I free them. But if I go around and be like some dictator, then that won't be a Buddhist monastery. That would be like some concentration camp with me as a, as the, as a commandant. In fact, I, mean, I don't know, there's lots of people my age. Before I became a monk when I used to watch TV, you know, one of my favourite TV shows was Hogan's Heroes. How many of you saw Hogan's Heroes? A few of you. You know my favourite character? He's my mentor. You know, was Schultz. He was like the, the guard. And when these, you know, these American sort of prisoners of war that went into the village to the pub to get drunk or celebrate, whatever they're doing, he'd always put his hand up here and say, I see nothing, I see nothing. I... Remember that? That, that, that? That's my example, my mentor for being an abbot. When I see the monks, I see nothing, I see nothing. 
with your kids when they start misbehaving. You parents, put your hands in front of your eyes, I see nothing, I see nothing. <laughs> that would be such a control freak. Love your kids and then live up to your love. Love your partner. He or she will live up to that. Love yourself for goodness sake. Open the door of your heart to yourself. No matter how you turn out. Whatever I'm going to do, whatever I'm going to be, the door of my heart is totally open to me. So that's fearlessness. That's can't control anything anymore. That's letting things be. That's love. That's freedom. That's Buddhism. That's that close to enlightenment if you can do that all the time. For those of you Buddhists, the end of craving, letting go, being peace. Okay, this is how it works. And you try that in your meditation and you find out it works. Too many people control meditation. That is why, you know, a lot of people, they try meditation, they can't do it. And they say, I give up, I can't meditate. You do it the wrong, blooming way. Just sit there, make peace, be kind, be gentle. Don't do anything. Let go of the doing, let go of the controlling. Let go of the fear. The path is easy when you have no preferences. That's from the great third patriarch of the Zen tradition. I don't care if it's Zen, whether it's Mahayana, Theravada, Vajrayana, whatever Yana. Because it's all good teachings. So no preferences, no fear, no control. And then the path is very easy. The path of meditation, the path of spirituality, the path of life. Just see what happens. See just how your life evolves. And even if you can send a copy of this talk to the Sri Lankan cricket team, they're likely to hear it because they may know me, not the Australian cricket team. When they really relax, they will do far, far better. Because when they tense up, when they're afraid of what might happen, of course they never play their natural game, do they? So many people, they can actually sing so perfectly, privately in the bath, they get in public, they tense up. Fear, why? Why do you do that? So, learning to let go of fear in these ways, by having this opposite, open the door of your heart to this moment, to yourself, whatever happens. And if you do make mistakes in life, are they really mistakes? No, to me that well, I thought were mistakes a long time ago. Now I think they're just cause for good fun and good humour. I like telling people my mistakes. Because it makes them laugh. Especially because you're a monk. Because a monk, especially you Sri Lankans, you think, I'm this holy monk. And so when like, big people make stupid mistakes, that's really funny. And I remember one time, I was in Penang. And I just finished teaching the retreat. And they were taking me to the airport. And because you know, it was uh, still the right time, they gave me this ice cream coffee drink. And I think it was from like Glory Jeans or something. And they had ice cream and coffee and lots of milk and lots of sugar. It was probably the full of cholesterol, diabetes, green hearts, but it was delicious. <laughs> but I started, they had a straw, I started sucking it from the straw. I couldn't suck it. I thought that the straw was blocked. So I sucked harder. And all my, the people, you know, my so-called disciples, the people who were taking me back to the airport, they're putting their hand over their mouth. They couldn't stop laughing, but they were embarrassed to laugh in front of me. And then I was sucking harder, then I finally realized why I couldn't suck it out, because it wasn't a straw, it was a spoon. You know, when I was growing up, spoons were metal things, you know, they were sort of a certain shape. And this was like this around, it looked, it looked just like a straw. And because of that, the thing at the bottom there was underneath you know, the, the coffee, I couldn't see it. So it was a natural mistake. <laughs> so there, the great wise monk was trying to suck coffee out through a spoon. <laughs> I remember about that other times. Yeah, it's one of the things we have to do as monks is do funeral services, and they're really somber affairs. And I remember, it's actually a Sri Lankan funeral because 
uh, the stone would come from my temple and the, one of his parents died and said, can you please come and do the ceremony? The parents never came to the temple, but the son did. So I said, sure, I'll do that for you. So I went to the you know, funeral parlor, I was a bit late, that was one of the problems. So I went in there and uh, started the service. You know, funerals are supposed to be very solemn. So I started you know, with a bit of chanting and I said, you know, we've come here to pay our last respects you know, to the, the mother of my disciple over here who's passed away. And at that point, this old lady stood up and said, it's not me, it's my husband. <laughs> <laughs> I got the wrong person who died. That was a big mistake. It was very funny. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful when things go wrong? Like next, when I go back on Sunday, every year we have this big Commonwealth Day service over in Perth. And actually, that that, that time when uh, we met the Queen, because uh, you know when we had the Commonwealth Games in Melbourne, they had some big ceremonies over here in Sydney as well, and the Queen did a sort of a service over in, what was it called, the Cathedral? Thank the Cathedral. Saying something or others. Anyway, so we you know, I just said, Jasmine and I went to, uh, uh, to, to say hello to one of Ajahn Sujata's favourite people, uh, Archbishop Jensen. <laughs> um, <laughs> say hello to him and, and go to, this was the same service we did in, we do over in, uh, in Perth. And, you know, it's some of the interface stuff we have to do and it's basically usually as boring as hell. It's all choreographed, this is what you're supposed to say. And then you sort of stand up and say affirmations. You have the same old sort of songs again and again. But this time, this was many years ago. Now, because there was some really weird Christian who thought this was evil to have a Buddhist monk and a, an imam and a rabbi in a, a Christian church, somebody rang up the police <laughs> and said there was a bomb in the cathedral. So during the service, you know, the, the dean was this policeman came in and. and Tell the dean to come over here and he whispered in his ears and the dean stopped the whole sermon and said, I'm afraid we have to evacuate the hall. There's been a bomb scare. So we all had to go out. And you know because that service was interrupted and because you know, we, we, you know, we hadn't any other appointments, that's actually when we started talking to each other. And that was the best service ever. And I did joke to the dean, we should have this every year, have a bomb scare. <laughs> because instead of things being choreographed and all you know, going according to an agenda, this was real life. Because when things go wrong, and we don't have things planned, and life just happens, that's actually when you meet people, you talk to them, you make real good friends. That is what life is all about. So please don't choreograph your life. I don't know what I'm going to do next. Even uh, Atta Sujata, he's got all the plans where I'm going to go after this. I don't know what I'm going to do next. And isn't that wonderful in life? Which means you're never disappointed. You're never afraid. Who knows what might happen next? Give up fear and then you can live life. Give up fear and then you can be free. Give up fear and you'll live a long and healthy life and also a very happy life. Give up fear and you won't control your meditation and you'll be just so peaceful. Give up fear and you may even stop shaking that tree and all the mangoes of enlightenment will just fall into your hand. Thank you for listening.